everyone. My name is Iris Awash. I'm the Director of Languages for the Saskatchewan Indian Cultural Centre. And I'm originally from and raised on Chagafi uh, Noyate, which is Carry the Kettle First Nation in Saskatchewan, Canada. I welcome you here this morning, where our presentation is on the language um, strategy uh, that we have developed at the Saskatchewan Indian Cultural Centre as well as other strategies which we will briefly touch on. Um, my lead presenter this morning is uh, SICC President uh, Dorothy Mayo. I'll let her introduce herself. And I want to uh, also uh, start off by thanking uh, the elder this morning that said our prayer for us, for all of us. And also want to say that, um, that I want to acknowledge and uh, thank the, uh, the Lakota um, people for welcoming us to, to their territory. And uh, we thank you for that and also um, that uh, on behalf of Iris and I, uh, we are very honored to be part of the uh, Language Summit here, and that I think these kind of conferences really have a purpose in terms of creating awareness and drawing attention to the state of uh, our languages, uh, not only in Canada, but in the U.S. as well. And that uh, they are declining in terms of uh, the number of speakers that are there. And uh, we'll, we'll share this information with you throughout our presentation, uh, what state we are in, in terms of uh, the languages back home in uh, Saskatchewan. And that uh, we'll talk a little bit about the structure that we work within, um, the institution that we represent here today, and that uh, we'll, we'll also uh, talk in terms of the responsibilities that we have as language speakers, our responsibilities to pass those on, uh, our, our, um, our languages to our young people, and uh, whether there are children or our uh, other relatives or grandchildren. One of the things that uh, we, we did, we changed our presentation slightly after, um, after being welcomed here, the hospi hospitality that we have uh, experienced here uh, attending this language summit and hearing the many stories of the sacred places, the special places, around this area, around this territory. We wanted to be able to share a story with you as well about where we come from, a special place that we have and that um, the role that this institution plays in preserving this kind of, uh, of story, this type of oral history and indigenous knowledge that uh, we all have been talking about for the past uh, day and a half here. One of our uh, authors, our scholars in, in Saskatchewan just recently um, um, published and released a book um, titled uh, A Ski Win. It's uh, by Doug Cuthand. And he uh, documented a story about a special place, a sacred place, uh, about an hour south of where we uh, are, uh, where our office is, our institution is located, uh, an hour south uh, from Saskatoon. And the story is um, is told from a Cree perspective, although I know that the same story is told in our language, uh, my language, uh, the Soto language. And also, I know that uh, other nations like the Nakota and Dakota have their perspective on this story. And you'll understand, once I tell you about this story, I, I'll read 
what Doug Cuthan has published, and uh, it's a uh, it's a really uh, special story. So we wanted to share this with you so that you you can tell your relatives about the story from our territory as well, a special place like your Black Hills, like your Bear Butte that you have here. So and. Long ago, um, in what is now Saskatchewan, um, which is fairly um, mostly prairie, at least two thirds of it is prairie land, there's a river that uh, cuts through that, that territory and it's known as the Saskatchewan River. And the Saskatchewan River uh, was our water highway in, in times prior to the newcomers arrival and that uh, it played a really uh, key role in terms of our livelihood as well as our uh, trade and uh, ceremonies that we, we had. Saskatchewan actually is a Cree word that means fast flowing and that that uh, it, uh, it links up with other waterways uh, in our area, including the uh, Elk uh, River, the Red Deer, Old Man uh, River, Waterton, and the Belly River. So Saskatchewan um, River is really one of our uh, main um, lifelines uh, prior to the arrival of the newcomers. The story I'm going to uh, read that uh, Doug Cuthand has uh, written talks about a, um, a place in a, um, a, a great rock called Mistassini. And it's, uh, as I said, it's south of Saskatoon where Lake Diefenbaker now sits where that location is now covered by a newly created uh, lake uh, called that uh, Diefenbaker. This was an area that our ancestors used to gather and it was a source of spiritual strength for many, many centuries. And I begin my story, uh, our story, I'll say, by by uh, words that actually my, um, my grandma and my um, mother always started off with whenever they start off with a story. They always say, Gayas, long time ago, I see Nioke say, Papma Tehochik, people were traveling. So many years ago, when the world was young, there was a small group of people traveling across the prairie. They were using travois pulled by dogs. Among these people, there was an old lady with a big dog pulling a big travois, and in the travois was a little boy. They came to a place where there was a lot of buffalo, and as they came close, the dogs chased the buffalo and stampeded them. The big dog ran off and the old lady couldn't stop it. The leash slipped out of her hands and away went the dog with the boy in the travois. They searched for a long time, but they never found the boy. Meanwhile, on the prairie were two buffalo bulls who lived by themselves. They were bachelors. Younger, stronger bulls had chased them out of the, out the old bulls and, and uh, the other bulls had taken over their, their harems. The two bulls were grazing quietly when they heard a young child crying. They paid no attention to it, but after a while, the older bull said, I think we should do something about this child crying been crying for a long time. The younger bull said, oh no, the bull, people are always killing us, chasing us, just let, leave them alone, let it be. 
the old bull said, I think we should save the boy. No, insisted the younger bull. I'll kill it when I get there. The old bull said, okay, let's have a race. If I get there first, we'll raise the child. If you get there first, you can do what you like. So the two bulls started to run. The younger bull stumbled and so the old bull got there first. There was a child sitting on the travois with the dog missing. So the old bull said, now we will look after this child. So they looked after the boy. They would take him to berry patches where he could eat. The boy grew up to be a very handsome young man. One day the old bull, kind old man bull said, we are now going where the sun sets, where there is a big meeting. Everybody will be there, but you are not one of us and you will have to stay away from the crowd. These bulls are very mean, very jealous, they fight each other, and if you make a mistake, if you even talk to one of the women, they'll kill you. So they traveled for days, and they came to a place with a wide plain near a river. There were a lot of buffalo. Kind old man buffalo said, now you have to stay here while we go. Be sure not to go anywhere and don't talk to anybody. So the young man sat on a flat rock and stayed there and the old bulls went with the crowd. What they were celebrating, we don't know. Later the young man had a vision. There was a beautiful young woman coming down to the pool. She was dressed in all buckskin. The young man jumped off the flat rock and ran down and asked her for some water to drink. Oh, come here, she said. She took a shell and gave it to him. He drank and drank. She filled her bag to take home. The young man ran up to the rock and sat there. As soon as a young woman filled her bag, she started to yell, hey, that kind old man, Buffalo son, touched me. Everybody heard. Kind old man Bull came running back and he said, now you're in trouble. The beautiful woman you saw was one of the white bull's wives. He's very jealous, he's very powerful, and he's one of the largest bulls around here. He's the chief buffalo. Now he wants to kill you and he will meet you and you'll have to fight him. So the next day, all the buffalo stood in a great big circle and kind old man Buffalo took his son there. He said, you are not one of us and you cannot fight that bull. I want you to roar four times to Kiwaitan, the north wind. And so the boy did. And he said, I want you to roar four times towards Wapan, the east wind. And the boy did. And he said, now, roar four times to Samhain, the south wind, the boy did. Then he said, now roar four times towards the setting sun, Nipawanak, as they call the west wind. And the boy had roared four times, he transformed into a beautiful buffalo. He stood up. Now you are one of us, said the kind old man buffalo. Now you have to fight the great white buffalo and he's coming. The great white buffalo's feet were digging into the ground, into the earth, and he was so big and strong. Kind old man buffalo said, you have to be careful, he's tricky, face him all the time. The only weakness he has is behind his front legs. If you can gorge him, you can kill him. He's very quick, but you are young and you're quick too. The great white buffalo came with his head down and he said, so you would touch my wife. I'm gonna wa walk around you four times, 
Then I'm going to charge. Kind old man Buffalo yelled at his son. Be careful, face him, face him, do what you can. As he stood by the side encouraging him. The great white buffalo charged after the fourth round and they locked horns. He pushed the young bull back, the young bull pushed him back. They fought all day and sometimes they would not be able to push each other. Their front legs would lift up. They trembled with strength. Finally, towards evening, kind old man buffalo yelled at him, do what I say, try and throw him off balance. They were very tired. Sometimes they would stop panting. Then they would charge again. They trembled with strength, pushing each other. The young buffalo pushed and twisted, and suddenly he gorged him behind the front leg. The white buffalo said, you got me, you got me, which way should I fall? The young bull said, you can fall whichever way you want to. I'll fall towards Samhain. The south wind, the great white buffalo said, and he fell head down and died. The crowd moaned and the bulls started to paw the ground. They were angry. Kind old man buffalo and his friend came running and they said, now you have to go away. You cannot stay here. You're not one of us. And you can't go back to your people because they don't know you or you don't know them. They've been looking for you. Someday they will find you. Now, I want you to roll four times towards Kiwetan. The boy did. Now towards Wapan, and he did. Now roll four times towards Sawin, the south wind. Again he did. Now roll four times towards Nipawanak, the west wind. He did, and he transformed back into a handsome young man. <laughs> The two bulls walked on each side of him towards the setting sun. They walked for days. And in time, they reached a beautiful place on the plain. Kind old man Buffalo said, you can't go back to your people and you cannot stay with us. You have to become something else so you will be remembered for what you've done. People will come and they will celebrate and they will remember you. Now, roll four times towards the north wind, Kiwetan, four times towards the east wind, Wapan, four times towards the south wind, Sawan, now four times towards Nipawanik, the west wind. The boy transformed into a mighty buffalo. Kind old man buffalo prayed over him, stretched his hand along his back, and they left him. One day, the old lady asked the medicine men if they could do something to find this young man. So they made the shaking tent call the spirits. What happened to this boy that was lost, they prayed. Suddenly a spirit said, he was discovered by two bulls. They raised him. He became a handsome young man. He fought the white buffalo and overcame him, and he was changed into a rock. As a remembrance for his great deed, you will find him, you will feel him. You'll go west towards the setting sun. So they went, and the medicine man said, I know we're pretty close to him. They saw a buffalo sitting on a prairie. It was a big rock and they stayed there. They gave him gifts, they had a feast, and every year they went back to remember the great thing that he had done. Years later, new people, newcomers would come and live on the plains. They built a huge dam on the South Saskatchewan River that flooded that valley including the great rock known as Mistessini. And my people refer to this rock as Mistessini Oasis. They tried to, rem to move it, but they broke it into pieces in the whole process. When it 
With it went one of our great spiritual gathering places, it re but it still remains alive in our people's hearts and minds today. So that's the story of Mistesni, or Mistesni Awasis. And part of the role that we play at the center as an institution is to preserve these stories as part of our oral history, our indigenous knowledge. In these stories contain many teachings and told in the language, I know that it just paints a picture in your mind's eye and they are told so beautifully. But today I had to tell you in the language of uh, our borrowed language, English, to, to communicate this. But I think Doug Cuthan, the author, did a really wonderful job in putting it into good words that I think we can understand, all understand and appreciate. So the, um, the oral history that, uh, and we've recorded many such stories in our, um, in our collection over the past uh, 37 years that the Institute has been in existence. Now, to tell you a little bit about how we came to be as an institution, in 1972, prior to that, there was a real big awareness, almost a movement in Canada about really questioning government policy, gov government practices, particularly in the area of education. And the leaders in our area, educators and experts, uh, gathered and they, uh, with other national educators, came up with what they called Indian control of Indian education. And this policy was, was pushed by, of course, our leadership in Canada, in the various um, provinces, but it was also behind that policy was elders uh, pushing the leaders to say that we've got to take back our education, the way our children are being educated. They weren't happy with that because like the residential schools, children were being educated outside of our communities in what was termed as integrated schools. So all of our children used to leave our communities for the day and be shipped back at the end of the day after the residential school uh, process uh, was uh, over. And I might add, the Indian residential school process spanned over, well over 50, 60 years in, in our area. There were 11 residential schools that were, that were set up in, in Saskatchewan. And these schools had devastating effects on our languages and our cultures. So really, the integrated school system was sort of still a step in the same direction as the Indian residential schools although our children came home each day. But the net effect of our languages and our culture was still the same, the loss of it. Or certainly, it wasn't valued in those schools. And the government set up tuition agreements with these schools, paid for our children's education to these, to these schools, in fact, Many of the, the towns and villages where these schools were set up uh, really were able to build nice gyms, nice uh, recreational facilities for those towns because of our children's tuition being flowed over there. So 
When the um, Indian control of Indian education policy was accepted, not only in Saskatchewan, but also across the country by our national uh, uh, body, it, um, it started a process where schools were being set up in our own communities, in our, right, right on, our, on our reserves. And that was the, the process that was called Indian Control of Indian Education. Now what that did was it built these schools so our children could stay in the communities and the elders wanted our children to have not only the, the basics of education being taught in these schools, but they had a vision of, of having our languages um, being taught so our children could speak the languages and learn about their own culture and have strong identities. Now, for 37, 38 years, we've had Indian control of Indian education. I have yet to know of any of our children, anyone <coughs> of our children, to come out fluent speakers. Because what happened, a couple things happened actually, is firstly, there was really no priority given to First Nations language instruction. In fact, if it was provided three times a week, 40 minutes per day, you know, that was all. Then, the other thing that happened, they gave the jurisdiction for the educational standards and curriculum to the provincial government. First Nations didn't control the standards, so provincial government prioritizes the things that they want taught. And it certainly wasn't First Nations languages. So it was really not a case of Indian control of Indian education. It was really devolving the administration of education by the government to First Nations communities because we followed rules that were established outside of our communities, standards that were established outside our, uh, our, our, our way of knowing, because our way of knowing and learning is very different from what the standards are. During the same period was when the uh, center was created and in fact, in 1972, the, uh, it was a college, Saskatchewan Indian Cultural College. And it really uh, was a, a birthplace for all of our other educational institutions. Our other educational institutions include first, what is now known as the First Nations University of Canada and our Technical Institute, our Saskatchewan Indian Technical Institute, SIIT. And these two institutions took over different parts of education, one an academic, one a technical. So the cultural college became focused on languages and, and cultural development and preservation. Our our role became fairly different as the other institutions evolved and got established. And where we used to deliver actual programs, we then focused on curriculum development and resource language development and recording oral history, stories, like what I just shared with you earlier. Now the center serves 75 First Nations and, and looks after or deals with nine First Nations languages. And that's a daunting task and almost 
an impossible task at times because the challenges of dealing with resources become fairly acute when our funding levels have really remained the same since 1972. Meanwhile, our population has doubled. Today's population of First Nations is 140,000. And when we started, it was about half of that. The other really important uh, statistic is that our 140,000 that at least 50% are under the age of 30. In fact, our median age, and, and what that, that means, I'm, I'm told, is that if we were to line up all of the 140,000 First Nations, the, the middle point of that is age 20. So 20, we have a very, very young population. Many of our young people that age 20 um, are unable to speak their language or First Nations language. And really, I can say no, certainly no fault of the p parents or grandparents uh, of, of our children. Because as you know, as I spoke earlier, residential schools were a factor in all in in the loss of the language and culture. So that's a fairly, um, you know, a grim picture in terms of our language or the future of our language more, more um, rightly. So the work that we have at the center is certainly focused on the youth. In fact, the, the two strategies that, that we've been working on for the past uh, two, three years are, is the language strategy as well as a cultural strategy. We felt that we can do a, a language strategy. In fact, we developed that first. And we, we, when we were developing it and working on it uh, as staff and technician, technicians, we said, well, we can't have a language strategy without a cultural strategy. Those two work hand in hand. And that because of the reality that we face here today, where we have a very young population, those two pillars are, should be foundational uh, in terms of moving forward with a youth strategy. So that's exactly what we decided we would do, is to do a youth strategy. But in order to do one, we have to talk to the young people. We have to get their input, get their perceptions, their, their ideas of what, how, how can we help them learn their languages. So we're going to go through uh, the next 12 months, 